My name is uh, David Dolev, uh, Managing Director of the MIT Israel Program and our other programs in the Middle East, all part of MISTI, MIT International Science Technology Initiative. And it's great to be here with you. Just 99, we'll get to over 100 people from all around the world to um, the band's visit, a, uh, an event with Tony Award winner, Jamshid Sharifi, and we'll be joined by uh, MIT uh, alum also, Tomer Manjubi, who uh, is studying at Wharton currently and was active in Hillel and also took part in the MISTI MIT as a program in an internship in Brescia, the same geographic area that the band visit is set. The idea of this event um, really developed from a conversation with Megan Hinckley from our School of Humanities. We were thinking about new ways of bringing Israel, an angle of Israel that we may not be aware of as much, into the MIT community. Some of you may not know that over 1,500 MIT students in a typical year take music classes. And we send just through the MIT Israel program through MISTI over 100 students every year to do internships in Israel and labs and companies and teach STEM and entrepreneurship in Israel. And beyond that, there are additional students that take part in Hillel programs and other programs in Israel across the campus. So having this type of event seems like a great match of bringing together the arts, the Middle East, and a, a geographic area of Israel, which we don't emphasize really as much as maybe we could have. When I spoke to Jamshid about his own story, I also felt, wow, this, my instinct felt really this is, this is the right type, of, right type of program. From my perspective, uh, the band's visit is about a group of uh, Egyptian musicians from a police band that come and visit unexpectedly a small town in the south of Israel. And it's all about the interactions that they have between them, the people of the village, people of this town, and the people of the town have with them in their own interactions. and sort of the reflective process that many of them go through during the whole show. All this is anchored in and surrounded um, with music. And this path that they take, I think in, semi, in many ways, it's similar to what our students go through and even each of us. The students that we send to Israel every year to teach and to work in companies and labs in Israel, they take that one step they do, they go to Israel, they take part in their internship and they learn how to grow. They learn how to connect with the country. They reflect on their own professional path and they develop in ways that they didn't really know would happen before they took that step. And all of us today also are, are navigating uncharted waters in so many ways for so many months now, and we still will be. And I really feel like it's so important to be able to anch be anchored in our identity and bring all of that and all of our, our identity into this world to really make impact. I felt like that in the band's visit, the experience of our students and where we are at today, each of us in our own, own home, trying to be anchored with who we are and, and really bring ourselves to the world is something that really brought this all, brought this all together. Um, so, this Journey Anchor Talk is organized by MISTI MIT Israel and MIT Hillel and co-sponsored by Music and Theater Arts Department. I'd also like to thank Samantha Quint, our MIT Israel coordinator, and Leah Kaplan, Administrative and Development Assistant of MIT Hillel for all of their work on today's event. Please note that you're all muted. You can send questions for our speakers and any technical issues via the chat function. You will not be able to talk with one another during the chat, during the, during the talk and we will be recording it. Tomer Manjubi will open the talk. This will be followed by Mr. Sharifi, and then we will open Q&A. The Q&A will be moderated by Rabbi Michelle Fisher, Executive Director of Hillel and alumna herself. So I'm happy to invite Tomer to open the program. Hi everyone, uh, it's good to see everyone. Um, just before I describe a little bit about my experience during doing MISTI uh, Israel when I was uh, when I was in college, I'll just share a few words about myself so you know who I am. Um, I went my freshman year of MIT, I was it was 2010. I graduated in 2014. So I started MIT 10 years ago, I guess. And um, I majored in brain and cognitive science and mathematics. Um, as David alluded, we sometimes take a winding path 
through life. And right now I'm doing a PhD in economics. Um, actually, I, when I started my PhD, I had never, I had had some research experience in economics, but I had never taken an economics class at, at MIT. Um, I was, so, so that just goes to show you that we take a, a winding path through life. Um, now, now to get to, uh, to Misty, I, I did Misty a few times. Um, once my freshman year, I was in Israel in Beersheba, which is in the Negev, the, the, the southern region for the whole summer. Then I did it two more times over my course at MIT, but I'll mo 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 mainly talk about that first time. Um, so as David said, uh, a major theme of the movie, The Band's Visit, seems to be that you never know where life will take you. And um, the movie is about this band who goes to Israel looking for a specific town, Petah Tikva, that's not in the south of Israel. And they're, they're looking to play at a specific concert, um, but they end up somewhere different, completely different in the south of Israel. And they, so they're coming to Israel with a very specific purpose and they end up finding something else. And that was really very true of my, something else and maybe something better. And that was very true of my experience during Misty. Um, so I came in looking, you know, to get primarily looking, I guess, to get um, experience in, in a lab, um, professional experience. I, I worked my first year at uh, Ben Gurion University in a lab. Um, it was a lab at Soroka Hospital, which is a, a hospital that's, I, I think, for the well known in Israel and um, in, um, in, for people with epilepsy. And we were applying neural networks to, to detect seizures in advance. So looking back, it was a great career experience. Um, this was in, in 2011, as I said. So the whole neural network technology and like data science boom was just starting. Um, when I was a freshman at MIT, when this took place, you know, there was almost everyone I knew was doing some sort of computer science, but it was all geared towards software engineering. And then when I left by 2014, Everyone was still doing computer science majors, but they had shifted to focus on data science and machine learning. So, so Missy gave me this great career opportunity to, to get started on an up and coming technology sort of ahead of the curve, which looking back at, I saw was, was a, um, you know, I, I value that as a career opportunity. But um, as David said, I think, uh, you know, we, we don't know where life will take us. And what I ended up getting from Missy was actually a lot more than just career opportunity. I ended up learning a lot about myself and about my heritage. And um, I also ended up making a lot of inter international friendships and, and cross cultural connections. Um, so I, I'll explain that in a minute. But just to give a little more background, I grew up as part of the American Jewish community in Boston since I was you know, since I was young. Um, I, I have many, many similarities and, and uh, fond memories with other American Jews. Just to give one example, uh, Hillel at MIT, I always felt like an extended family to me, for better or for worse. Um, I remember uh, I would go to Saturday morning prayers at Hillel every week, and um, that, that was, I guess, the, the better part of, of being part of an extended family. The worst part is me and my roommate, because we had to get up early. <laughs> we there was somebody in our in our fraternity who would wake us up and, and bring, make sure we'd come to the prayers. And so we knew what this would happen. So we'd always like lock the door. Sometimes we'd barricade it so that we wouldn't have to wake up early and he would literally be dragging us out of bed. So for better or for worse, I've always felt like I was part of the Jewish community at, at MIT and in the United States. And I always felt this huge connection. Um, but there, there's, uh, I also am a little different from, I guess, most American Jews. First of all, my family, or a lot of my family is from Egypt, um, whereas many Jews in the US have uh, Ashkenazi or European Jewish heritage. So that means that some of the culture, cultural traditions and the food at home were different. Um, additionally, I'm part of a, a very small denomination in Judaism called Karite Judaism. Um, my family has always been part of it back in Egypt and today. And, um, and it's a very small uh, tradition that's not well represented in the United States, but that's better represented in Israel. Um, and it just so happens that in Beersheba, about 10 minute walk from my lab, there was a Karite synagogue there. I and mean, I was 18 at the time and I had, you know, I knew I was Karite, I had some opportunity to connect to my heritage, but I had never really had the opportunity to connect with a community that was thriving. The, the one in the United States in Boston where I lived was very small and sort of uh, informal. Um, 
So I, I decided to go to the synagogue. I, I just went one Friday. I really liked it. Um, I started to meet people there. I became more and more involved. And um, I, you know, I learned about some, some traditions that were part of my heritage that, that I, uh, I never knew. Um, I also became involved. I started helping to teach uh, like religious classes or, or Torah classes to, to young children who were at the synagogue. That, that was lots of fun. Um, and I think what I, what I took away from there that I wasn't expecting to take away was two things. First of all, is this connection to, to my heritage and my traditions that, um, that has stayed with me for a long time, past, uh, past MIT and, and to the present day. And the second thing is through this synagogue, I was able to connect to a lot of se segments of Israeli society that I think I otherwise would not have connected to. So it's really common when you do an MIT or an internship in Israel to connect with other people who are, you know, working in a lab or in tech or software engineers. Um, but this let me connect with a much wider range of Israeli society. So I, you know, I met I met people who were in labs I, through the synagogue. I met people who uh, who were electricians, mailmen, you know, working in the army. You name it. I got to meet a really wide range of people, and I got to meet people of all ages. You know, not just people who were. Um, of working age, sort of prime working age. I got to meet older people. I got to meet kids, as I said, and that really opened up Israeli society to me in a way that I wasn't expecting. Um, and I saw, I, and uh, it, it was great. One advantage was it was great for my Hebrew. I had learned Hebrew in, in school, but um, one thing that happens when you go to Israel is uh, you, uh, you know, you try to start speaking in Hebrew, and then because you want to practice Hebrew, and then the Israelis all want to practice English, so they switch to English. Um, but when you're speaking with kids or maybe older people or people who are less involved in the international workforce, uh, they're more willing to speak in Hebrew with you. So this was great for me to practice. Um, but uh, even more than that, uh, I think what I, what I took away was, um, was friendships and cross-cultural connections that lasted with me beyond, um, beyond uh, MIT. So I'll just give two quick examples of that. Um, one, one is maybe a little bit, uh, it, it may seem trivial, but, but it, means, it means a lot to me. So I met a friend, um, Avi, who, uh, when I met in Israel, and um, he's a really great cook. He knows a lot of our traditional recipes. Um, last Passover, I was cooking, uh, I was on the West Coast, I was cooking um, late at night, the night before Passover. I knew my family on the East Coast were all asleep, but I also knew the sun was rising in Israel, um, and I needed help with the recipe. So I called Avi up, you know, I hadn't seen him in a few years, but we, we talked through chat and stuff. And I said, hey, I don't know how much, you know, pepper I'm supposed to put in this recipe, help me out here. Um, so, so it's kind of this funny thing where this, this Israeli guy who I met at, at Misty, I still felt comfortable a few years later ca calling him up and being like, hey, I, I need help with the recipe. Um, another nice thing is uh, through the, the um, community I met, this um, really, really talented musician, Gautam Cohen. He was on uh, Israeli, uh, the Israeli version of American Idol. It's called Kokhav Nolad. And um, he also was a Khazan that knows our community's specific traditions. A, a Khazan is like a cantor who knows our community's specific traditions. Um, and uh, so when it came time for me to, I, I got married in 2018, four years after having left MIT. Um, and for our wedding, I, I actually called him up and I was like, do you want to fly to the United States and and uh, do my wedding? Because you know you have a great voice. You know you know the, the liturgy. Um, can you do it? And he agreed. And uh, and first of all, everyone loved him. But it also felt what when he was doing it that I had not just somebody who was like doing my wedding as a, as a paid service, but also a friend who was there with me. Um, and you know he stayed at at my house the 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 days before or with my parents' house the days before. Um, you know, we had dinner with him, we talked with him, showed him around Boston. And the night before, there was stuff we had to print for the wedding. And wouldn't you know it, the printer was malfunctioning and everything. Um, and I asked him sort of half jokingly, am I the least prepared person you've done a wedding for? Um, and Israelis are very honest. He looked at me and said, yes. Um, so, so just to wrap up, uh, I think that you know, Misty has, has given me an opportunity to 
make connections with, learn more about myself, but also make connections with people who are on the one sense and the other side of the world coming from a really different cultural background, but in the other sense who feel really close to me as a result of this, me having been able to spend time there and meet them and also having the, the connection through, through our, our joint uh, religious community. Um, and another thing that, that sort of struck me at, at when I watched the, the movie, The Band's Visit, is at, and the, the movie focuses on this um, orchestra uh, for the Alexandria police. And at one point, somebody asked the head of the, of the orchestra, why does a police force need an orchestra? And the, the police, uh, the head of the orchestra responds, why does a man need a soul? So this is sort of how I feel about what I got out of the Misty experience. You know, I came in maybe looking for a career experience, but I ended up getting interpersonal connections and cultural understanding that have stayed with me, um, you know, throughout my time past MIT, whether it's me trying to make one of our traditional recipes at home or getting married and, you know, fixing, fixing things up there. And, and, and it's, it's something that stayed with me and that, that has enriched my life since then. Um, so yeah, that, that's my Misty experience. Omar, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, moving to hear from you in the space of so many years about your experience in Israel and also like the intersections with the, with the themes in the band visit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Mr. Sharifi, who's going to share about his own path, how he got invo involved with this show that takes place in Israel, challenges on his path, the tools he gained from MIT, also one of our alumni, and maybe some advice for us all. Jamshid Sharifi is a New York-based composer, producer, and keyboardist. He has composed the scores for the feature films Harriet the Spy, Down to Earth, Clock Stoppers, and Muppets from Space, as well as contributing music to numerous other films and television shows. As a producer, arranger, and keyboardist, he has recorded and performed with Paula Cole, Ray Charles, Dream Theater, Laurie Anderson, Hassan Hakmon, Snatam Kaur, and many others, and has written orchestrations for the Broadway shows, The Last Ship and The Band's Visit, for which he won a Tony Award in 2018. Mr. Sharifi graduated from MIT in 83 with a degree in humanities, and summa cum laude from Berkeley College of Music in Boston with a degree in jazz composition and arranging. Thank you very much for being with us, Mr. Sharifi. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for that introduction, David. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all and uh, see so many friendly faces. Um, as David said, I've uh, found a, a life in music, which still surprises me to this day. Um, it, it was a, you know, a, a dream I had as a young person, but uh, was never really sure on how to, um, how to bring that about. Uh, just a bit of my own history, I was, born to a Persian chemist father and a uh, American piano teacher mother from Kansas. Um, I grew up mostly in Kansas City, although we did spend a little time in Iran. Um, I've been involved with music really my whole life, first as a student of my mother's and then later uh, with, um, with uh, other teachers, more advanced teachers in both classical and jazz. Um, when I finished high school, I felt that I wanted to find a path in music. Um, I had applied to colleges and had been accepted at MIT, but decided to defer it for a year and spend a year learning about music. I wasn't sure whether I would go to MIT at the end of that year, um, but uh, after spending a year kicking around, including some time in New York, um, I was visited by my dear friend from high school, uh, Shlomo Weil, who now lives in Israel. And he told me I really needed to go there. And I, I think it was his advice more than anything, more than the advice of my parents that made me go to MIT and, and uh, try to find a path there. And it was challenging because I felt at the time that it was not, you know, it wasn't about music. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And yet it was fabulously stimulating environment with, um, uh, I mean, I mean, an environment in which people pushed themselves and, and found ways to excel. 
Um, I spent two years at MIT, uh, went one year to Berkeley College of Music as a kind of uh, domestic year away, um, and went back to MIT for one more year and graduated from the human humanities department. During that time, I played in the jazz band with Herb Pomeroy, which was a very formative experience. He conducted MIT's jazz band for 22 years. Um, I also studied with Barry Verco in the um, computer music department, which was um, would prove to be quite valuable in my career later on. And studied with Tamar Bowes, who um, was a profound teacher for me, uh, both in his rigor and in his passion for music. Um, at Berkeley, I, well, I spent two years at Berkeley studying jazz comp arranging, um, met a lot of musicians. It's one of the great things about the school is it, um, it, it is you do make a lot of good connections and, and make some really lifelong friends. Uh, but uh, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do at the, at graduation, which was in 85. It so happened that her Pomeroy was retiring from the MIT jazz band in that year after 22 years of doing it. Um, after asking one of his peers to conduct the band, he kind of crazily asked me to do it, uh, which I, I think most of the music department didn't know what he was thinking, but um, it was a phenomenal experience to, you know, to be forced to lead a band twice a week in rehearsal to come up with material, to source the material, um, to figure out things to say. Um, I did that for seven years and uh, loved it. I loved the students. I loved their passion for music. Um, the, the amount of time and energy that they would put into the group was phenomenal. Also during that time, I was teaching at Berkeley in the music synth department, um, which had always been a strong interest of mine and um, you know, was much aided and, and helped by the time I'd spent with Barry Verco in the computer music department at MIT. Um, in 92, I moved to New York um, and uh, began looking for things to do in, in music. Um, and uh, it was challenging at first. It was very hard to find work. But eventually, friends that I'd made at Berkeley connected me to other people. Um, and uh, I began to find things to do, um, both, uh, both in terms of performance and arranging and composition. Um, I don't know that there was any one thing that, you know, in which I can say, oh, that's when things started to happen. But gradually, things did start to happen. Uh, you know, uh, I would be connected to this person who would connect me to that person and, um, and then find myself in a situation where things were really rolling. Um, I would say one of the most important things that, uh, that, um, that helped me career-wise was really friends from Berkeley connecting me to situations that were ongoing or, or happening or developing. Um, a person that I met at Berkeley, Ben Whitman, connect me, connected me to Michael Gibbs, who had also been a Berkeley teacher. And it was through Michael that I met people in the film industry and um, worked for Michael on a number of uh, his scores as an orchestrator and a keyboardist. And met film producers that eventually got me my first studio film, which was Harriet the Spy. Um, that was in 1996. Um, and uh, also through, um, well, let's see, back up just a second here. Um, it, was, it was prior to this time that I began to find a desire for music for for elements in music that that touched my soul in a way that um i didn't always find from commercial music um and this led me back to the music of my father 
which was the music of Iran. Um, I had always heard this music growing up and I began listening intently and studying it and um, looking at music really all around the region, uh, music from the Arab world, music from Eastern Europe, um, uh, West African music, which I studied as well. And these, these pursuits uh, led me to making my first record, which was, I tend to think of as a kind of pan-cultural um, recording. And uh, it featured a number of singers, non-Western singers, including Hassan Akmoun and Mamak Hadem from Morocco and from Iran, respectively. Um, that uh, that uh, to well that that gave the record and the project a, a more organic and and more vital um, uh, flow or or root, um, and this became a thread in really much of the music that I did. Um, it, uh, a lot of the film projects that I found. Uh, including um, uh, the the, uh, the piece "Ornament of the World," which was about uh, medieval Spain and the intersection of Muslim, Christian, and Jewish communities there, um, I was able to incorporate some of the studies that I'd done and some of the work that I'd done in Middle Eastern and uh, and other non-Western musics. Uh, so this was the, this has been a thread in music for me for well, 25 years at least. Um, and of course, going back to, to my own father's experience, uh, my own experience with, them, with my father and the music that he played for me. Um, how the band's visit came about was, well, uh, it came about from working with, uh, uh, working with a friend of mine on a number of projects, a Berkeley associate. Uh, he, was the music director on Sting's musical, which was uh, put on Broadway in 2014. And he's a, a guy who tends to overload himself with work and um, and save things for the last minute. So he called me up three weeks before opening and asking asked me if I could split the orchestration with him um, as he knew my arranging well from other projects we'd done together. So we, we uh, did those orchestrations together. I went to Chicago where the, the musical was um, was doing its out of town run and got to know some of the people in the Broadway world. Um, and it was through that contractor, Dean Chernow, that I met David Yazbek. And David and I met and he said he was working on a musical based on a film called The Band's Visit. Um, she told me to go see, so I did. Um, now, this was a, as it was a musical, the, the, he was writing new music for this piece and, uh, you know, not basing it really on the, on, the, um, on the score of the film, but on compositions that people could sing um, because the, you know, the score in the film is, is a more traditional film score. It's not song-based. Uh, whereas any musical is going to be based on songs that the characters sing and and relay the drama of the show through um, through song. Um, so David and I connected well and um, started down that path. And the the production also uh, had me advise him on Middle Eastern music, as they knew that I had it. You know some history with it, and and um, had been making music in that realm. Um, but the score, you know, the songs were David's composition. If you listen to his other shows, you'll see the the thread there. But colored by uh, a Middle Eastern thread, and of course, it, it was my job to orchestrate it, which means really arranging it for the the band that's going to play the songs in, in you know live in the theater. Um, I tried as well to choose instruments that would be reflective of the music. In particular, we used Oud, um, an Arabic violinist, and uh, clarinet as dominant voices in the ensemble, 
We also had a second keyboard player who played mostly kanun parts. Uh, we had considered having a kanun player, but um, but that seemed a little a little too tricky in terms of tuning and also in terms of finding subs. Um, so there were elements in the orchestra, small as it was, that were reflective of Middle Eastern music. And it was my job to arrange the songs that David wrote for that ensemble, and um, which is which is what we did. Uh, we first put up the show at the Atlantic Theater for a month. Um, it was very well reviewed. That put us in line for a Broadway opening, and it had a very successful, rather short run on Broadway, but very critically successful. And as you probably know, it. Uh, the Broadway show won 10 Tony Awards. It was, it, was, um, it was a very good year for that show. It's since closed, but it did have a, uh, about a year of touring across the country. And, um, and uh, it, was, you know, it was a wonderful experience, really fascinating experience. For those of you that haven't seen the movie, it, it was outlined, uh, outlined by Tomer and also by David. Um, it is about an Arabic, uh, an Egyptian police orchestra that ends up in the wrong town because of the Egyptian tendency to confuse the P and the B sound. They were looking for Peta Tikva, which is a uh, cultural center or mythical cultural center and end up in Beta Tikva, which is just a little outpost with the cafe and really nothing else. Um, and it traces the interactions of the, the two groups of people. It's it's beautiful in that it doesn't uh, explicitly address the Arab is any Arab Israeli conflicts. It's really more about the people and their interactions, their personal interactions, especially their failings, um, which is I think one reason that it it's made such such an impression on Broadway because it is intimate and small and really achy in a lot of places. Um, all about missed opportunities and new opportunities. Um, so it was it was a really blessed project to work on. Um, uh, most of my work these days is studio based, as you can see. I'm sitting in the studio here, and it's things like that: arranging, production of records, um, composition, mostly for film, um, sometimes for live ensembles. I still keep uh, in touch with Fred Harris, who I believe is in the meeting today, and have written some pieces for um, MIT ensembles, which is a huge pleasure for me to go back there to re-interact with students after decades of being here. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a really, it, it's a very fortunate and blessed existence and I feel really thankful for the the, um, for the you know the work and the situation that I found myself in looking back on MIT um, as I mentioned the you know meeting her Pomeroy meeting Amar Bose meeting Barry Verco and studying with them those were invaluable experiences um, but larger than that was the the community, the the this you know the can-do spirit that you sense at at MIT, the um, the sense that any problem can be overcome. Um, I haven't really found that anywhere else, and it's wonderfully refreshing every time I get a chance to go back there. Um, fortunately, in the past ten years, that's been a number of times. So, hmm. Um, that's, I mean, that's the, <laughs> that's my capsule story. Um, Michelle, I know we're a little early for questions, but if you want to uh, start things off, I'm happy to, um, to, uh, uh, to articulate or expand on any other subjects that people are interested in. Sure, there was one question that uh, came through of um, 
But first of all, thank you, uh, uh, Jamshid, to, for joining us today and for you know opening this up. I'll remind people if you want to have uh, questions, please put them in the chat. Um, the one question that came through was, was there much collaboration with the actor musicians in the cast development? Um, well, collaboration, well, the an interesting thing about musicals is that they are they're usually rehearsed with just a pianist, sometimes a pianist and one other musician member. If it's a very rhythmic score, it might be a pianist and a percussionist or a pianist and a drummer. Um, and the musicians tend to come late in the game, really in the last couple of weeks of rehearsal. Uh, and this is a financial consideration because the production does not want to be paying uh, an orchestra, however many people it is. In the case of the band's visit, it was nine, but but in you know in something like um, South Pacific, it's thirty-two people. It's a it's a lot of numbers to be paying, especially because musicians are trained to learn this material very quickly. Um, the, everything's written out for them, so they're playing a written score, and you know there may only be a few days of rehearsal. That said, there was there's always a lot of interaction between the actors and the pianist who is usually the music director of the show. So when rehearsals begin with the full band, the pianist knows really everything about the actors that are singing the songs, all of their quirks, all of the things that they need for say entrance, uh, their preferred tempos. Um, usually by this time, keys have been decided on, but um, any quirks that, they want, you know, most of theater is is not done to a click. It's not done to a regimented, I should say musical theater. It's not done to a click or regimented tempo. There's a lot of flow. And learning to play those songs effectively requires that the music director know exactly how the actor is gonna take it. And of course it varies from night to night, but the, you know, there'll be dramatic pauses. How long are those pauses? How does the actor pick pick up into that. That happens between the, the pianist, music director, and the actors over the entire rehearsal process. So when the musicians enter the fray, all of that information is conveyed to them by the music director. Um, and then as the show develops, there does tend to be a fair amount of interaction between the musicians and the actors as they get to know each other. Um, the band's visit had one peculiarity which you don't often see in a musical, and that was that one of the musicians was one of the actors. Um, he came into the show auditioning as an actor for the row of Kamal, um, a kind of wry, cynical member of the Egyptian police orchestra, and then offhandedly said, well, you know, I've studied Arabic music when I was a kid, and he picks up a violin and plays, and he's just a badass, pardon the expression. He's just a phenomenal Arabic violinist. And he says, and I play oud and, and I sing and I play percussion. <laughs> like many Arab musicians, um, you don't really necessarily specialize in a single instrument. You learn the whole orchestra. So when we heard his audition as an actor, we were like, we want him for the band. Um, so that he was always part of the deal and always a connection. Uh, and I think that opened up a greater connection between the musicians and the actors. The other thing was uh, both David Yazbek and David Cromer wanted to preserve the sense from the film that the Egyptian orchestra was part of the action. So four of our musicians, including um, the uh, the actor playing Kamal um, are on stage for much of the action and they they don't have any lines aside from Kamal but they are present they are you know they have blocking they move from place to place sometimes you'll see them just sitting in a corner having a little jam session um, it made it was a very technically complicated to pull this off because some of the times they had to play down in the pit in the basement some of the times they had to play on stage so they had two different monitor mixes and two sets of monitoring tools. And there would be some very tight changes where they'd be running downstairs to get in their seats for the next queue. Um, but uh, but it, it 
brought something magical to the show to have more of the music visible and present, um, you know, to see, oh, that music that I'm hearing out of the speakers is actually coming from somebody's fingers. That, okay, I see his fingers on the fingerboard. I see the bow on the strings. Um, it's, it's, it's something, interestingly, in, in many musical discussions about musicals since that time, I've heard a lot of people wanting to incorporate that into their own show. And it's certainly not the first time it's been done. I saw a wonderful production of Fiddler on the Roof in which the musicians were on stage the entire time. But here they were, they were really characters in the show. They're, you know, they're wearing the same light blue, uh, as they said, Michael Jackson suit as the rest of the actors um, and wandering around and being a part of things. So yeah, sorry, that was the long answer. The short answer is yes, there, there is a fair amount of interaction, but it's, you know, it's filtered in different ways. Thank you. Another question came through, have you spent uh, any time in Israel and would you like to see the band's visit performed in Israel and in the Arab world? And how do you think it might be received in each of those places? Um, well, sadly, I have not had a chance to go to Israel. I was, I had a tour planned with a friend of mine, Ellie Zach from school who plays guitar and, and um, had performances in Tel Aviv and at um, Elat down on the Red Sea. And I, at that time, got my first TV commercial. So I made, unfortunately, a financial decision to take that. And it turned out to be very lucrative um, and it was worth it, but I missed going to Israel. I, th I would love to see the band's visit in Israel and in the Arab world, um, in particular because of the, the way it does not address Arab-Israeli conflicts head on, but lets them play out in the background in the very human interactions, interactions between the characters. Um, one of the strongest things in the film is the leader of the orchestra dismissively saying that to the, you know, the leading woman, uh, Dina, who runs a cafe in Beta Tikva, um, that, oh, she wouldn't be interested in the music that we play. Uh, you know, it's classical Arab music. It's the music of Um Kultum. And, and she says, I love Um Kultum. I grew up listening to her and watching Egyptian movies on the TV. And I'm crazy about Omar Sharif. And she sings this beautiful song about uh, Um Kultum and Omar Sharif. And it's, it, it's such a wonderful way of getting past the, the brutality and the ugliness of the political conflict and saying, we're connected through music, through soul, through the things that speak to us. Um, so I think it would be, I, I, it would be fantastic to see it performed both in Israel and in the Arab world. Can you tell us a bit about how the musical score incorporates uh, uh, Arabic scales, harmony, and rhythm with some of the more traditional uh, Broadway music? Well, the the composition, as I said, you know, the score is composed by David. Although I did give him some, you know, really minimal advice at the outside, just uh, guidance as scales that I thought would be useful or or you know, the particular ways that I dealt with melody. Um, I, th for me, I think David walked the line perfectly. I think the songs, I, I mean, in particular, the song Um Kultum has become a very popular audition song for musical theater singers all over the world, which, it, which means there's, there's something truly musical theater about it. Um, and yet it does, you know, it does convey the, the magic of Egyptian film and the, the beauty of Um Kultum singing. Um, how did that happen? Uh, I, I mean, partly David was listening to a lot of Arabic music in particular because this is supposed to be an Arabic orchestra. Um, I remember sending him a lot of uh, uh, rhythm tracks from my own films and records saying here, you know, try writing something to this. 
um, a lot of things in 6A, a lot of things featuring Darbuka, um, things that are not based around the drum set. And um, having though, you know, starting with those tools, I think guided him to a score that was a little bit off, it, well, more than a little bit off of the norm of, of Broadway. Um, and, you know, I should also mention that our, uh, our actor playing violin was a wonderful influence because he studied the real deal as a child. His whole family would, were musicians um, and, you know, and performers of Arabic music. So. so it's interesting that you described yourself as Persian as opposed ah. to Iranian. Um, I know that that's how Jews from uh, Iran or uh, Iranian uh, origins refer to themselves as well, in part as a way to separate themselves um, as part of an ancient culture of coexistence from the current image of the Iranian state. It's also inspired cultural creation in Israel and music, theater, cinema, and even television. Um, how does this identity structure play a role in your creation? Well, well, you know, growing up, I think we used the terms Persian and Iranian interchangeably. Um, although most Persian Jews I know do prefer the term Persian. Um, the, Hmm. I, I mean, you know, I, I obviously have a lot of problems with the current regime and, and this has been a ongoing tension in Iran for really 1300 years. Uh, Iranians have this view of themselves that their culture goes back 2,500 years. You know, that, that the height of our culture was when the Persian ex empire extended uh, all over the map and these Muslims, they're Johnny come latelys that have come tried to impose their culture on us. And the history of Iran really from that time is an oscillation between periods of religiosity and periods of, uh, you know, celebrating the uniquely Persian or Iranian culture. And I think we're just in one of those religious periods. Obviously the time prior to this, the, the Shah was, I mean, the, the Shah changed the calendar to 2,500, right? Uh, it had been on the Islamic calendar and he says, nope, we're, we're going back to the height of the Persian empire. So for a while I had a birth certificate that said I was 1,200 years old. Um, but so, so I, you know, I'm ever hopeful that the, the, the worst instincts of the Islamic government will tend to fade away and the, the sense of the Iranian people will return to, to incorporating their older history. But the fact is a lot of young people are leaving. Um, my entire, in my family, everyone in my generation lives outside of the country because they don't currently see a future for themselves there. Um, either economically or personally, there's not really you know, a chance for public life. Um, it's, it, 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 I mean, we know in this past year what it's like to live with pandemic and be shut in. And that's really what life is like, is, it has been in Iran since 1979. So if you can imagine a 41 year pandemic, that's, that's why the young people are leaving. Um, but, you know, I still feel very much connected to the place, um, to its physical beauty, to its, culture to the food um it's you know it's a kind of ache that i think all expatriate persians carry and i'm technically i'm an i'm an american i grew up here but uh, there's a part of me that feels to be an expat iranian because i can't really go back there um you know it's uh, at least my dad won't he, he won't let me <laughs> so anyway um, it's amazing, you know, as you describe the fact that like it is your heritage, it is, and yet you can't go back there. Um, mm -hmm. And you're able to take some of that and put it into the music, put it into your career. Um, there were a couple questions about, you know, advice for others. One was, mm -hmm. what advice and resources for singers or composers do you have, would like to, and I'm going to go in two ways, 
incorporate their heritage into their musical mm -hmm. career, and mm -hmm. in particular for incorporating Middle Eastern and world music into anyone's uh, career who's uh, a singer or a composer? Well, my, my own feeling is you kind of marinate in it and soak in it as much as you can, and then it will become a part of what you do. Um, it's, uh, you know, it is possible, say, to listen to pieces of a particular culture's music, transcribe them, learn to play them, and and you know, in an intellectual way, bring those elements into music that you're composing. Um, but I think it it is most effective when when it's more a process of stewing and and sitting on it for a while. So what that means to me is a lot of listening, a lot of seeking out and 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 finding that music that speaks to you and getting it in your ear and hearing it over and over again, hearing the phrasing, hearing the, it, it's a lot like learning a language. I mean, it's very much learning a language. Um, you, you're not just trying to learn the words, you're trying to learn the accents, the way the words are spoken, the way the words are put together. Um, and that to say incorporate Persian music into what you're doing or incorporate um, really any culture's music that takes time and repeated exposure. I do think also you should transcribe um, and I think you should take what opportunities you can to study with someone who's better at it than you. It doesn't even have to be a master, just someone who's walked a little bit of that path and can instruct you on what to bring in, what to seek. Um, one thing that's very helpful and, and I found very interesting, uh, you know, I was, I'm a keyboard player. I played piano my whole life. And I'm, because of my interest in synthesis, I've, I've been a, a, a real advocate of playing the synthesizer in an expansive way. And when I was trying to learn Persian and Middle Eastern music, I would try to adapt it to the synthesizer, which is not a natural fit. Um, and I had some fair amount of a success doing that. But what really kind of sunk it into my head in a whole different way was someone giving me a sitar. That's not the Indian sitar, but the Persian sitar, a small three string lute. And uh, just, you know, touching it, playing it, um, getting my hands on it. Uh, I mean, it, it has a voice that is from that music. And it, the, the instrument itself guides you to making that music. I remember in music school, uh, a keyboard friend of player, a friend of mine was talking to a sax player, a friend of mine, a tenor saxophone player. He says, man, you guys that play saxophone, you have it so easy. You just wiggle your fingers and out comes jazz. Um, and you know, what he was saying is saxophone is an instrument that is so associated with jazz that when you start playing it, you start hearing jazz. And when I picked up the sitar, I was like, God, I just wiggle my fingers and out comes Persian music. So if there is a draw to, to, you know, to bring a culture's music into your own music, I think one of the most effective ways is to study one of those instruments. You know, so if you were an Arabic musician, you, I mean, if you wanted to study Arabic music, you might play Kanun or Oud. Um, or if you wanted to play West African music, then you probably play djembe. Um, because the, those instruments were developed in concert with the musics. Um, they, 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 they speak the language of that music um, and the instrument will help you find that more strongly. So you have a keyboard next to you. I don't know what other okay. instruments are within your grasp. Would you play uh -huh. something for us and explain the principles you implement in your music? Well, <laughs> principles, oh my God, okay. Well, you know, I went to, I went to uh, Berkeley for a number of years. And um, of course we studied jazz and there was, I, I put a lot of energy into playing jazz, um, you know, so.
so that's that's what I was doing in college right? <laughs> is trying to um, trying to get into that world uh, and it's it's a beautiful world you know there's so much history and it's so much wrapped up with American thinking and feeling um, but uh, but as you know as I developed as a musician and began to look farther outside of Western music, outside of pop, outside of jazz, outside of classical, then it drew me toward, as I said, the music that I heard as a child, the music of my own culture. And um, that, uh, that may lead me more to a place, you know, that's... So Fender Rhodes is not maybe the best instrument for uh, expressing that, but, um, but you know, I do what I can. Thank you. I didn't, even, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go, I, I, there was something else you're gonna say, I'd rather hear that. Oh, no, I was just wondering, I, I didn't even check to see if that uh, if you could hear what I was doing. <laughs> I just started playing. The sound came through. I, okay. You didn't have a plug directly into, you know, the uh, Zoom screen, but the sound came through. Thank you so much for playing. Oh, uh, oh, my pleasure. There was another question actually about music, and someone was uh, wondering whether Arab music reflects the rhythm and cadence of the Arab language. Hmm. That, I don't think I could speak accurately on. Um, I mean, when I think of Arab rhythm, uh, the, it's, I mean, so many of the rhythms that I, that I remember and know are in six, which, um, you know, makes them different than what we think of as Western rhythm, which is very often in four, not always, but, but, uh, you know, if you turn on the radio, you're, 95% of the songs you hear are going to be in 4-4. So just from the numerical perspective, it, it is different. Um, it's 6-8 uh, rhythms, which are, as I said, common in Arabic music, tend to be really dance-oriented, driving. Um, they, I would say there's a reflection of, of Arabic personality in the rhythm. Um, I don't know if it's matched to the speech, though. Uh, but, you know, probably someone has written paper on this, and I wouldn't be surprised if the answer is yes. A very MIT question now. Oh. Deciding to apply to and matriculate at MIT, were you ever on a science track? You said that your father was a chemist. I was course five when I was in grad school at MIT. Right. Did you consider the sciences or engineering, or did you foresee music as a viable option at MIT even before you got here? Um, and I then would, once you were at MIT, how much science did you actually pursue before graduating in humanities? My initial plan was to, to do uh, computer science. Um, and But w within a year, my, uh, my friend Shlomo, who had guided me to MIT, my high school friend, uh, told me about this program offered by the humanities department called Option 2. I don't think it exists anymore, but it did at the time. And it basically allowed you to make up your own major. You know, this was the late 70s. We were still in the late 70s period of, of, of uh, a fair amount of liberalism within the school. So if you could, if you could come up with a, a plan that made sense, then they would let you pick what courses you wanted to take and 
um, you took the courses and that's and then they give you a degree at the end. Of course, the degree was de was granted by the humanities department. Um, so I did some science study, but when I found this path, um, and especially when I found that that you could do one of the years away, I thought, well, yeah, okay, I'm going to go to Berkeley and do the music part of the education there, and uh, I'll, you know I'll do the science here. You also had to take some like science technology society courses, which were wonderful because they, in those days, most of them were taught by Sherry Turkle, who was, you know, a, a goddess to the, the tech industry. Um, and uh, so to be, you know, with, to be with her in class like two days a week was fantastic. Um, so, but I, I never, well, I shouldn't say I never because, uh, you know, coming as a freshman, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but once I got a sense of where this was going to go, uh, I thought it would be some kind of science plus music um, degree. And then how has, you know, the fact that you have an MIT education impacted your work and your career? Have you seen that either opening doors or affecting the type of work that you take on? In the largest sense, in, in, in the large scale, I would say yes, because I came into the music industry at a time when, um, at a time when the musical technologists and the musical musicians were converging to be the same people, um, and this was all technology driven. You know, in the in the sixties and the seventies, there was a class of people in the music industry who ran recording studios, who operated consoles, who ran tape machines, who knew all of the ins and outs of the technical tools. Um, and they were scientists for the most part. And then there were guys that played instruments and they came in and they recorded. But as digital recording and, and the digital audio workstation became the new paradigm and new reality, um, those tools started becoming more affordable. I mean, one of the reasons that studios were the way they were is because you needed to gather one or $2 million worth of gear to make a, a decent recording studio. Um, but the DAW revolution made that possible with 10 or $20,000 worth of equipment and now even less. Um, so the, the kind of role that I find myself doing all the time, which is producing records or writing arrangements um, requires me to be completely fluent with digital audio workstation uh, and also requires me to interact with the people that I'm working with musically, to write arrangements, to very often play on the records. Um, so just the other day I was singing in Farsi, which I'd never done before. Uh, it came very naturally, but you know, I had a long, history of singing because of church choir experience. Um, so yes, it's, it's been invaluable to have, especially the teachings of Barry Verko and Amar Bose. And, but more than that, the, the, you know, the, the pervasive sense at MIT that any problem can be worked through, can be solved. Um, I've never had a fear of the technologies that have come down the pike as far as music goes, which was, has made them quite transparent to me. It's made me very fluent in, in working with those tools so they don't get in the way of creative process. Um, so yeah, I'm extremely thankful for both the specifics of the MIT education, um, you know, the teachers that I mentioned, and for, for the overall mindset that that we can do this, we can get it done. I feel like we should have that as part of the advertising for students applying <laughs> to MIT. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it Absolutely. up with email and admissions and hopefully. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. What are you working on now? Um, I'm producing three records. Uh, one is a record of English poetry for a, a classical singer. Um, so, so that involves co-writing with her and writing the arrangements. The, the ensemble is piano, harp, strings, 
woodwinds and some Celtic instruments. Um, another record for a mantra group, uh, we're co-producing that. They're recording half of it in Ireland and I'm recording the rest of it here. Um, that re requires me to play bass and guitar and keyboards and a bunch of other stuff. And then a record for a Persian singer that I've worked with for a number of years, Mama Khadem. She's just, as you know, she's a classical Persian singer, but very, um, very adventurous in her, her taste. So we're doing, uh, well, once we've done one song, this collaboration with Chris Martin from Coldplay. Um, and the rest of the songs are in, in a bunch of different directions. It's really an adventurous album for her, but she is such a phenomenal singer, just, you know, one of the finest Middle Eastern voices I've ever heard. And then a, a, a writing arrangement for Donnie McCaslin. Donnie, it was Donnie's band that collaborated with David Bowie on his last record, uh, Black Star. Um, and Donnie has uh, taken that music and he's commissioning a series of arrangements for him and rhythm section and orchestra that he's going to tour with. And he's, I think his first dates are in Australia in, um, in the summer, COVID permitting. So that's, that's a wonderfully exciting project. I mean, just because Donnie's such a phenomenal uh, saxophone player because of his long connection with Bowie. Um, it looks like Gail Ann Dorsey will be singing the songs. Uh, if you know Bowie's music, you, you, um, you may know that she was his bass player for a number of years and sang alongside with him through much of his music. So she's, you know, she has the sound in her ear from direct, like monitor blast in live performance. So those, those four things are all running simultaneously. And any chance that you'd be collaborating on, we had a, we had a movie, we have a musical. Will the musical mm -hmm. be going back to being a film? That's always possible. Um, I, I don't, uh, but I don't know that that's going to happen just yet. I think they'll, you know, they'll post COVID see if there's, if they can renew the touring, um, because that tends to generate potential interest. I mean, David's already written another show. He he did Tootsie for uh, Broadway, which is, um, which has since closed. Um, but we, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go from here. Fingers crossed. Any of your last comments, thoughts, or advice for all of us? How are you getting through COVID? What do you suggest that we're, you know, listening to and doing to go and get through this time? Mm, well, um, hmm. I try to listen to things that are are more on the quiet side, more on the meditative side. Um, I mean, for me personally, as I spend so much time in the studio and in my own studio, uh, COVID hasn't been that dramatic of a change. Of course, it's eliminated all touring. Um, it's eliminated all remote sessions. We can't do any string dates because you know that requires string players all sitting close to each other. But it is so much of the industry was already geared toward remote recording that that we've been able to, you know, continue much of that. Um, but as far as the <laughs> dealing with the stresses of everybody at home all the time, just, you know, it's a day by day thing. Um, it's, it's definitely challenging. Thank you so much, uh, Jamshid. This was an incredible, you know, conversation. It was incredible to hear your story and to hear your music um, mm -hmm. and uh, your advice for uh, everyone. Um, I just want to say, you know, a deep uh, appreciations and thank you uh, for this uh, today. Thank uh, you for inviting me. It was a great pleasure to speak with you all and interact with you. Um, <laughs> and um, Jamshid, if you have a website you want to share with everyone and want to put it into uh, the chat at this point for people, I'm sure that they might appreciate uh, going there and, you know, seeing more. Um, and we also want to thank Tomer for uh, his story and for opening us uh, today. Uh, thank you to Samantha and to Leah for all the tech support. Um, and um, 
Thank you to uh, David um, for giving us this opportunity um, to show how the collaboration that we do together between MISTI Israel and uh, MIT Hillel on campus and for and with our students also can play out in the virtual world uh, with programs such as these. Um, and lastly, thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, it's Thursday, which is never too early to wish you a Shabbat Shalom and even have a great weekend. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at further MISTI and MIT Hillel programs uh, that we do individually and hopefully collaborating on uh, together. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tomer. It was a pleasure.